What is the value of your words? Don't underestimate the power of words. Think about a judge. A judge with the power of a relatively few words. In few words he'll say, you, freedom. Or the same person, you, lack of freedom, go to jail. In other places, it could be even bigger than that. It could be you be condemned to death. It could be the electric chair or another form of torture or indeed an end of life situation. The power to spare a life or condemn to death. Think of a doctor. In a few words, they can bring news that delights or news that devastates. For every word in Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, meaning my struggle, 125 people were killed in World War II. Words have great power, don't they? For good or for ill. So words have power. Don't waste them. This short section that we're looking at tonight is a lot about words. Devote yourselves to prayer, it begins. Devote yourselves. Devote. When we hear the word devote or devotion, we think of somebody who's generous. An action that is selfless, that is sacrificial. And this is how our life should be in prayer with God, sharing with God, sharing with him continually. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Where it says watchful and thankful, that's being watchful and thankful in the prayer. So that when we are praying, we are thinking about what to pray about. We're watching what's around us that we be praying about it. We're aware of the situations in the world around us, ourselves. Jesus and his disciples in Gethsemane. What did he say? Watch and pray. Be aware of the situation. You need to pray for yourselves. Be thoughtful. Be careful. Because real prayer demands our full attention. And our full energy. And the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, within us. Remember that some people say, well, at least I can pray. As if that's a little thing to do. Actually, the greatest thing we can do is to pray. Because we are reaching out to God, aren't we? And how much power has God got? All power. He is almighty. So prayer You could define it as asking God for what he wants to do and give. Asking God for what he wants to do and to give us. So it says be watchful and be thankful. Not just asking. yeah, Not just asking. Be thankful because of all the Lord has done for us in the gospel. Be thankful because of what is goodness in his generosity every day. Be thankful because of his presence with us and his keeping power. And thankfulness in prayer keeps us from being self-seeking. Yeah? Always asking for things. And also it helps us, from, uh, prevents us from being dutiful in prayer. And just doing things in a very ordinary kind of way. And getting into a, a bit of a rut. Verse 3 says this, And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. So now Paul is giving a request for prayer, for the Lord to open the door, as a lovely image, isn't it, of him opening a way for us to step out further with God's saving message. So you think, oh, another door onto something else. You know, that's, that's really good. But think of where Paul was. He wrote this. He was 
either in prison or under house arrest. So he actually wasn't able to go anywhere at that moment himself. He wasn't actually asking for prison doors to open, but for the doors of ministry to open. And God knows all things, the opportunities where we see none. Yeah. For the gospel to reach not just the ears, but the also to the, the hearts of those who hear it. That's important, isn't it? Because you know, we, can, we can have lots of hearers, but unless they are actually touched in their hearts, it's a bit like the seed in the parable of the sower that falls on the hard ground. And then the Holy Spirit will do that work which only he can do. Paul says, For which I am in chains, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. And it's a reminder of the cost of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Again, we've mentioned it already tonight. We enjoy freedoms. We think we're, we've got hands tied behind our backs, perhaps, by, the, by, the, um, by what we might have had 100, 200 years ago. We have things difficult but by comparison to people the other side of the world or maybe not so far away we have many many freedoms and the cost of following Christ as we prayed earlier for Pastor Barrett in India and this morning uh, for those Afghan Christians trying to flee the homeland and look for a suitable place to, to rest It's very, very hard, isn't it? Verse 4. He says this. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Clearly. So Paul recognises the need for clear presentation of the gospel. And so should we. Um, I've been for the last two, three years, um, developed this thing called the eight-word gospel. And it was simply a way of getting people, even children, um, to a point where they could understand uh, the gospel and be able to explain it in as short a form as possible, not to make it easy, but to make it so simple that it was virtually unforgettable. And these things would be building blocks on which they could then be witnesses of, of the God's gospel. And so the, the eight words, they're in f- four different phrases of, of two words each. And it starts with God rules. God rules. That God made everything. We've been looking at that ourselves, haven't we, in Genesis. But in the other end of the Bible, in Revelation, there's a verse that says that he is worthy. So he's worthy of all glory and honour because... He made everything and he sustains everything. And so because he is the maker, he's also the owner of all that we see and we ourselves. So it's not about us waking up one day and thinking, right, how does life serve me? We've got to remember whose we are. We've got to remember that God rules. That's always our starting point. That God made Therefore, you're owned by him. And that's me, you, whoever the shopkeeper is, the neighbour is, the family member is, the person on the other side of the world. We're all owned and made by him. So that's God rules. First two words. Second two words, we sin. Again, we've been looking at that, haven't we? It's just this morning, Genesis 3. We sin. And we, he says, we've turned our back on God and we have fallen short of his glory. Yeah? So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that leaves us in a very sad position because we're thinking, well, it seems hopeless. God is in charge, God rules. But I've sinned, so therefore, 
how, how can I stand before him? And that's why the wonder of the gospel is so beautiful. That's why the story of Jesus, the saviour coming for us, is so good. And the next phrase is God provided. God provided. That God sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And the hope of the gospel sweeps in like oh, like a breath of fresh air. Like that's it. The freedom, the chains coming off. The vision of, wow, now I see. Now I see what God wanted to do all along. So God rules. We sin. God provided. And lastly, we respond. Because we all respond to that news. Either accepting it or rejecting it. Every one of us. If you're saying, well, I'm undecided, well, that's a rejection, isn't it? If you haven't chosen to take it. But God's word is quite clear. It tells us in John 3.36 that he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And God's wrath remains on them. God's anger at the sin. Because you've chosen to keep hold of it rather than give it to the Lord Jesus. Who paid the cost on the cross. That's just a way of sharing the gospel. We need to know the gospel. We can't just pray haphazardly. As it says here, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And that's why I'm I'm daring to say to you as well, it's not just for the Apostle Paul, it's not just for the professional, as it were, minister, evangelist, whoever it is. Every Christian should know and live the gospel. Verse 5, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Now when it says outsiders, that almost seems rude, doesn't it? But it's not being rude to others or about others, because you're either in a family or you're not. There's a clear distinction between those who are and those who aren't yet or don't want to be in God's family. But the way is open for those outsiders to come in. But until they do, they are indeed outsiders. And most aspects of the Christian life and experience will be a mystery to them. They won't understand why we are here right now. Listening to God's word being read and explained. Because they would think it's, it's boring. Or not very understandable. Over a hundred years ago, uh, Dr. Will Houghton was pastor at Calvary Baptist in New York City. We're not the only Calvary Baptist. And this is really interesting. A man hired a private detective to follow him, to follow Dr. Will Houghton, the pastor, around. And after a few weeks, the detective told the man who hired him that Dr. Houghton's life indeed matched up with his preach, 